The Isle of Wight Zoo is home to 18 tigers, and this morning, one of them isn't feeling well. Go ahead. Hi, Charlotte. Uh, when we let uh, Zarina out, uh, we had a look at her coming out there, and uh, her mouth didn't look that great this morning. Uh, she had quite a lot of saliva coming out of it, as well as uh, looked, looked the area where, that, uh, where we saw the problem with the tooth. Yeah, OK, Paul, I'm on my way. It's been two weeks since the 14-year-old tigress had her hysterectomy. Vet Ian Green removed a benign tumour from her uterus and she has been recovering well. But the team have now noticed she's suffering from painful teeth. Hi, Paul. So, how are we looking with the teeth? Well, I mean, as it is, uh, just, just from watching it coming out of it, there's, there's uh, very much... Uh, a certain amount of discomfort. Um, she spends a lot of time licking that area. Yeah. And she's even she's even um, using a paw a bit to to sort of rub it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a fair amount of discomfort. Right. Well, I think we should contact Ian then, and then put up a plan for probably knocking her out again. And it sounds like it might be an extraction job. Probably. Zarina seems to be in a lot of pain, so the operation will happen today. At the other side of the zoo, they're encouraging natural behaviour from the park's only white tiger, Xena. The process is called enrichment, and it's something she hasn't experienced before. This is actually a, a boomable that's been converted into a bit of a rattle. And what we've done is we've uh, got a hard plastic ball inside. We've put lots of little stones in there, so it makes quite, a, quite an interesting sound. And of course, we wrapped it up with a fire hose. So the idea is that uh, when the tiger gets hold of it, they've got, they've got an area to grip on it and, and, and to pull it around and play with it. Eight months ago, Zena had to have her right eye removed. She was in severe pain from a condition called glaucoma and a dislocated retina. She recovered better than anyone could have hoped, but last week, the team discovered that the vision in her remaining eye was worse than expected. The pole PT didn't really work for, from, the, from that point of view where we could actually get it to work her muscles and that and to jump or to focus. So hopefully with something like this, we'll have a much different uh, sort of uh, um, sort of comeback, a positive one, because she'll be able to, to see it visually. Uh, it is quite, quite a lot larger. Uh, it's on the ground as well. Um, so she'll be focused down, looking down for something. And, and, and it's, it's going to be different. It's a different sort of uh, article as well that she can play with. Unfortunately, Xena doesn't spot the new toy. But she can smell something different, and guided by scent, she tests the new object. But she's not sure about the unfamiliar sound. Although Xena's sight is impaired, she does have acute hearing. Tiger's lower levels are set at a lower frequency than ours, but their upper limits are about six or seven times higher. The team hope that this noisy enrichment will be perfect for Xena. With cats, generally, you've got to, you've got to be adaptive. You've got to try and outthink them in every possible way. Xena, like all the other tigers, her eyes are attached to her stomach. She just sees everything as food as possible. Meat is the one thing that, that they all love. But you can't keep feeding them meat. You've got to try and find other ways to to stimulate them. So we use the boom walls in the water in that form. It's like she'll go in and she grabs it out and she rolls it around and pulls it around with her. She gets her claws and it looks really quite uh, cool when she, she does it. It's the same with all cats, you know, right from even the lions, who when we give them cardboard boxes, you know, they act like you know, a sort of over overgrown domestic cat at the end of the day. They all love something that they can, they can destroy. But destroying her new toy is the last thing on Xena's mind. The ball is surrounded by fire hose, and Xena's not keen on its taste or its texture. As she's not interested, her sister Zia is let in to have a go. Zia is slightly dominant over her sibling, so she makes her claim. Oi, Zia, come back here. Zia can be a cat that's quite hard to please, but it seems she's taken with this new texture.
the toy is now hers. But I think by introducing Zira into it, what we've done is also create a little bit of a, a competition between the two because they've, they both, want, when they got it, they seem to establish a sort of it's their, their toy even though they don't know what to do with it. I think it's more about sort of maybe more mentally, mentally stimulating than physical work and uh, also, also it's interesting to see that there's a dominant structure as well with these two females so it's quite, quite nice. Every nook and cranny is tested and tasted and Zia's had enough. Zena wasn't initially interested, but if it's good enough for her sister, then it's good enough for her too. Back with Zarina, Vet Ian Green is here to operate. It's a worrying time for the team. It hasn't been long since she had her hysterectomy, and anaesthetics close together can be dangerous. But Zarina is feeling really unwell, so it's the only option. The 14-year-old has got wise to Ian's presence with a dart gun, so today he's opted to use the small window in her bedroom. Ian uses a prod to make sure that Zarina is definitely asleep before they go in. She's notoriously difficult to anaesthetise, and if he didn't do this check, the consequences could be disastrous. She just moved a bit when I... Okay, good one. A couple more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Yeah, that's loose. Mm. Within just a few minutes, Ian can see the problem is worse than they thought. What I've found is that um, we've had quite a progression of, of disease going on here since, um, since she was spayed. One of her teeth further back is now actually loose um, in its sockets. Um, the canine here is markedly loose. Um, yeah, and there, there's clearly a lot of pus and blood coming out. Now, hopefully it is just purely as a result of infection. Um, the second possibility, though, and, and that infection is tracked back along the bone um, to cause uh, loosening of the other tooth. The other possibility is could there be tumour there? Um, and there's not there, there's insufficient swelling for me to be convinced on the possibility of tumour. Um, and certainly, this is all consistent with just infection. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm hopeful of. Blood and tissue samples from the infected area will show the extent of the infection. The first tooth that Ian removes is a small carnassial tooth. These are the ones that tear meat. Tigers have 12 of these, so removing just one shouldn't cause Sarina too many problems. I've take, taken one out so far. Um, and a large canine tooth is going to come out now. At eight times the size of a human tooth, a tiger canine should be harder to remove. It's, it's so loose, I mean, it's not... Um, I'm going to want to send some of that tissue off. With the canine tooth pulled out, Keeper Paul can see something isn't right. Do you think in that um, flesh of the tooth is that you think it's something to... I am concerned that that's a nasty tumour. I'm now 90% sure this is tumour. Oops. What's the chance of it not being... So not being malignant? Oh, zero. So yeah, if this is tumour, this is... You know, when you see the changes they've been, you know, just in the last two or three weeks. <sighs> it's been a difficult few weeks for Zarina, so this new possible diagnosis is devastating to Charlotte and the team. 
if it is tumour, then we're talking about cancer. So, not what we wanted to find out. We have had a tiger with um, cancer in the mouth before. There's nothing that you can do. So it's another waiting game. Find out the results from the lab. We'll, we'll have that result back in a handful of days. Um, and unless, I mean, if she has perked up dramatically as a consequence of taking these out, the okay, she can keep going a little bit longer, but if it is malignant tumour, we are going to have to call it a day. Yeah. The keepers at the Isle of Wight Zoo have their work cut out, creating imaginative ways to keep the big cats stimulated and healthy. Today, Helen is making what they call an enrichment that will hopefully excite the cats. The idea is a feeder log. Holes are drilled into a thick and sturdy piece of wood and meat will be placed inside them. Big cats are destructive, so strong fire hose will be wrapped around the wood. This will also give the cats something to grip onto as they attack the object. First up is Jaguar Chiquita. She immediately spots the log and attacks. <laughs> A jaguar is the ultimate predator, and in the wild, almost no prey is too ambitious to target. This enrichment is proving extremely effective. Jaquita's using all of her muscles, and that growling noise is an aggressive and possessive vocalisation. She's letting everyone know that she's particularly excited and would fight to the death to keep hold of her prey. Across the way, 11-year-old male tiger Chandru is also getting his teeth into the same enrichment. And just like Chiquita, he's very excited by it. The meat hidden in the holes is horse meat. It's very pungent and a particular favourite with the big cats. Tiger teeth are eight times larger than ours and extremely strong. Chandru's powerful jaw and teeth are supporting his very large 45 stone frame. He's displaying typical tiger behaviour. In the wild, if they can't pull an animal down in one swipe, they'll grip onto a vulnerable area. Once their jaws lock, they'll hang there and calm down to restore their energy before they have another go. Back with Jaguar, Chiquita. She's still engrossed with her enrichment. The jaguar's jaws seem stronger than those of the other big cats, and Chiquita is using them to hold her entire body weight. This constant tension is a brilliant physical workout for Chiquita. She's also using her brain, ears, and her sense of smell. Everything is being put to good use, even her sense of spatial awareness. She is clearly trying to protect her kill from anyone who might want to take it away from her. It was, it was a very aggressive attack on it. It was almost as if it was a, a living, breathing animal in her enclosure. It's just the most amazing response, really, yes. She grabbed it with the front legs and used that raking action that they do in the wild with their back feet, and like your domestic cat will. As you grab hold of it, it rakes with its back feet. Now, the cats were doing exa almost exactly that action. The, the action with the rear feet is to disembowel the prey from underneath. So what we saw there was, was a very natural response to, uh, to something that they really loved and wanted to get hold of. Chandru is still trying to kill his prey, and he's using fighting technique. You see, tigers fight by standing up on their back legs and holding their paws out on either side. A tiger's claw measures around one and a half inches long, and it's as sharp as a razor blade. And this makes them a devastating predator. And once their claws sink in, unless they want to let go, there's no escape. I'm trying to put a lot of effort into uh, to nuking this. 
and the fire hose is a pretty strong material and it's I mean it's designed to maintain, hold a long time long, long last lifetime and uh, he's uh, he's he's done some serious work in it and see that's where the canine was in through so I had a really good time look at this it's uh, good damage The Isle of Wight Zoo stopped its tiger breeding program several years ago to create a centre for unwanted, surplus or rescued big cats, all in need of long-term care. Their mission to home more tigers continues and in the office, animal manager Charlotte has some good news. I'm looking at Rambo's card out of America, really. This is the final paperwork from Wildlife and Fisheries in America that um, say it's A-OK -okay for, for Rambo to leave and, and come back to his roots, back to the UK. And we've been waiting a long time for this. Sadly, there are more tigers in captivity than remain in the wild. 11-year-old Rambo worked in the US as a performing animal for a few years. Then he was given temporary refuge in Florida. His full background is uncertain, so the team here are unsure what to expect. We don't know, you know, what he's experienced in his past. We weren't there, we don't know. He's had experiences that we will never know about. Um, we know that his living conditions have been far from ideal. Where he's living now, they've done their best to care for him in the right way, but we don't know, for example, when he was living in Texas, because he went to Texas to, you know, play a role in sort of being a celebrity tiger, opening hotels and so forth. We don't know the conditions that were attached to that. We don't know um, how he was persuaded to do the work that he had to do. Um, so we have got to take that all into consideration, be very, very calm and very careful with getting to know him and try and just read between the lines. He can't tell us his story, so we've got to try and piece everything together a bit like a jigsaw and um, get as close to a, a, a true representation of the animal that we're looking after, character-wise, as possible. So it's a challenge we're all looking forward to. While Charlotte finalises the paperwork, Rambo's future home is being built, and it's almost finished. I'm sat in the new exhibit, which Rambo should be coming into when he's finished his quarantine. Um, I, am, uh, I am in the Isle of Wight Zoo. This could be India, because it looks exactly like what I was sat on a year ago in, uh, in India. And we have recreated it as closely as we can uh, do, you know, being its UK climate as well. It's got lots of bamboo that will take hold, that he can hide in amongst. So quite a, a culture shock for him when he gets in here after six months. Um, but, you know, hopefully he'll enjoy it. Um, and we're not far off completion now, a few more weeks to go of, of hard work. Um, and then it will, it will settle down for a while and he'll be moving in. It's taken six months to build, and it's the third in the zoo's grand project to recreate five natural environments for the big cats. The other two enclosures have been designed around jungle and water themes. This new one, though, will appeal to the tigers in a different way. Tigers do like to get up, you know, high off the ground and look down and, on their surroundings. So we've got the pile of rocks here you can see behind me, which um, goes up to sort of six metres in height. And with him standing on it, he'll be seven metres up. So he'll be able to look over the whole zoo and the whole of the seafront here and, um, you know, enjoy his views. At the moment, Rambo is living in a flat area, but this enclosure's design should improve his physical state. He'll be able to climb over the rocks and, and he, he should put some muscle on, so I think that'll be much better for him. He'll be a much fitter cat after a while. It's been a few days since Tiger S. Sirena's operation to remove infected teeth. The concern was that the mass surrounding her canine tooth was cancerous. Sadly, the results showed that it was she had an aggressive form of oral cancer. It's quite common in tigers, but it's not treatable. As difficult as it is for the keepers, they have to do what's best for the animal, and Zarina would have been in great pain. So the kindest thing was to put her to sleep. It's never, ever easy, and it doesn't matter how many times you experience that, it doesn't get any easier at all, um, because it's every individual animal, then you've got a different and special relationship with that animal. And when it comes to a close, obviously, you know, there's a kind of a, a mourning period for that, really. So that's the, the harder, harder end of the job. 
Tsarina had lived at the park since she was 18 months old. You know, I've never had a conversation with Tsarina in the 14 years she was here, but I felt closer to her than to many people. She's been a handful, actually. She's been a handful, but she's been, you know, um, a tiger that we've enjoyed every moment of, really. You know, she's, she's been a very outspoken member of the cat sanctuary and always held her own. It feels a little bit eerie, to be honest, without her here. Until recently, Zarina had been a healthy and active cat, but at 14, she was an older tiger. In the wild, 15 years, and that's, that's it. She'd be a really old lady by then. So, you know, to get to the age of 14 years, you know, then that, that's not a bad run in the full scheme of things. Although, obviously, when we're looking at things from quite a subjective angle, you know, we, we feel dreadful, and that's only natural, and that, that feeling is going to last for a while, but then we're going to be able to reflect and look back and, and know that, that when Zarina was with, with us here, we gave her good quality of life, and we were with her, in fact, right to the end, which is important for us as well. A team from the Isle of Wight Zoo, which rescues big cats, has arrived in Miami, Florida. They're here to bring male tiger Rambo back to the UK. But they have to wait 24 hours, so before they can collect the 11-year-old, they've headed north to see the work of Big Cat Rescue in Tampa. It's the world's largest sanctuary for rescued big cats. The latest statistics are that there's more tigers in Florida and Texas than there are left in the wild. I mean, not only is that horribly sad, it's just how do you regulate that? How do you regulate these thousands of animals? And it's not just tigers, you know, it's also lions and cougars and leopards. The problem stems from the lack of a federal law that covers the entire country. Even if you do have strict laws in one state, it's very easy to drive to a neighboring state which may have laxer laws or no laws at all. So what we really need is a federal law that will encompass the entire country. And another big problem is the fact that there's an industry. These animals are only valuable for a very short time, and that's when they're young. That's when it's still safe to let people interact with them, get their photo taken, you know, possibly pet them, hold them. That's, that's the only time they have any real value. So and you're talking about an animal that would live 20 years in captivity, and the lifespan that they're useful is less than a year. So it's really an industry that has a high turnover. You've got to produce a, a high volume of animals to feed the industry. This 45-acre sanctuary is home to 150 wild cats of 18 different species. The cats are confiscated from unusual situations all over the US. We have the white tiger, Zabu, and she came from a zoo that went out of business, and she does live with a male lion. And they were raised together. Um, you know, you, you could speculate, maybe they were gonna try to make white ligers. A lot of places do try to crossbreed the two, and that is possible. When you're talking about genetics and saving these animals, that's just a ridiculous thing to do. But they're here. Cameron has had a vasectomy and Zabu has been spayed, so we have no chance of any ligers at Big Cat Rescue. <laughs> but they do get along kind of well, which is sort of amazing because the tigers are solitary animals. And then when you have the lions that live in, in the prides and the big groups, they're sort of social, but they figure it out. I think um, they don't speak quite the same language some days, but they, for the most part, they get along very well. Hello. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. We bought the British by the sea. You did, it's nice to meet you. It's great. Charlotte and Greg's work in the UK is similar to the work done here at Big Cat Rescue. They're at the hardcore end of things here in the States, rescuing cats from, you know, literally seconds away from being euthanized because they've been kept as pets. You know, and these guys are working religiously to try and <laughs> take in as many cats as they possibly can. And a similar situation to ours, obviously, we we're all trying to help in a very messed up world, basically, and uh, educationally as well, to get the message across to people. That's what these guys are doing here. And yeah, just interesting to see how that corresponds to the work that we do, really. This week, Big Cat Rescue collected four new cats who've retired from a life as performers. The two lions and two tigers have all arrived with problems. Two of these cats actually have collars on them. 
but these collars are, are too tight and probably they were much younger when they were put on. So it's going to be a, a challenge for us to get these collars off. It's on the two cats that are the most afraid and probably the most difficult to get close to. So we don't want to just sedate them, we don't know their exact health and that sort of thing. So it's going to be a challenge to get close enough to be able to cut these collars off or get them off. We don't know how embedded they might be, but when you see the, the lioness you can see how, how tight that collar actually is. Many of the cats that arrive here are also overweight. Of course, but living in a domestic situation where the area is a lot smaller, um, the exercise is different and the diet is different because people don't generally have much of a clue on what to feed them when they're living indoors. So a lot of them are you know, a little bit more weighty than, than what we have. And also, living in domestic situations, they have been declawed as well, so to make that safe for the, for the people. So um, again, they, they, you know, they can't exercise quite as much. The team will now begin their journey south to rescue Rambo and take him back to the Tiger Sanctuary in England. The Big Cat Care team back on the Isle of Wight are on another mission. Just like domestic cats, tigers suffer from arthritis and the older they are, the more of an issue it can become. The thing is, for us at the zoo, it is common because we have a lot of elderly cats, so it does affect a large proportion of our population. But I think generally, with any cat, be it lions or tigers, eventually they will get arthritis, so it's not a, a species-specific. Uh, and as it is for us at the zoo, we've got 18 tigers, so we have a, a bit much bigger population, so we tend to think, well, wow, we've got a real problem here. But as, 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 as it is, it mainly affects our elderly, elderly cats at the end of the day. The oldest cat here is 15-year-old male, Zar. And today the keepers are beginning a care programme for his arthritis. OK, first one there then, Paul. We're going to be putting some matting down and it's basically going to be cushioning him when he sits in the night room. Um, so it goes underneath his hay, so it acts like a bit of a springy surface for him. Two months ago, Zar was sedated for a medical examination. He was struggling with his mobility and test revealed advanced arthritis. Zar was given food supplements to keep his joints supple, but he hasn't improved, so the decision's been made to put him on some stronger medication. Ian, the vet's going to be uh, darting him very shortly as well, just with, just with a little bit of uh, cartilage regeneration medicine. It's uh, quite a new experimental thing. So when he has that done as well, it's all going to go as part of a big sort of overall care package for him, basically. A, a really extra comfy bed, um, as well as cartilage regeneration, which we're going to be doing on a, on a, on a weekly basis for him uh, until things drastically improve. Zar will get four of these injections, which should begin to repair the cartilage damage caused by the arthritis. He does still clearly struggle, you know, on, particularly on, on cold, damp days. Um, but on the other hand, he's not totally crippled. He's still mobile, he's still getting an enjoyment from life. We just want to make sure that we keep that enjoyment as a, a, as high a level as possible for as long as possible. This is basically, I think, it's just a trial at this stage to see how, how it's going to work with him, uh, how it's going to affect him. Uh, from, from, and, and, and if it works, there's a good chance we're going to try it with the other cats uh, that have got arthritis and, and see how it progresses from there. More than 4,000 miles away from the zoo in Florida, Charlotte and Greg have finally arrived to meet male tiger Rambo. Rambo, come on then. The 11 year old was rescued from a circus. He was bought by a British woman so she could ensure a more appropriate place for him to live in his retirement. Hey boy. Rambo's new home will be the Isle of Wight Zoo, but in the meantime, he's had temporary refuge in South Florida. It's taken almost 18 months to organise Rambo's trip to the UK, so Charlotte is pleased to finally meet him. Say hello. Rambo. Hey, we've come a long way to see you. Come on, boy. He's not actually quite as big as I thought he'd be, but he's a nice, friendly cat coming up and chuffing and seems quite relaxed. Obviously, he doesn't know what's about to happen. Um, I mean, he appears to be in, in good health. 
The man who looks after Rambo and the other big cats here has very limited resources. Both he and Rambo's owner don't want to be interviewed. He has done his best. It's, it's in a prime spot for hurricanes and he was hit badly two years ago and, you know, and the funding isn't there. Um, government funding, it's not open to the public, so, you know, he's doing his best, but, um, you know, there, there could be a lot more done for these animals, really. And there's a lot of big cats here in areas which are really, really unsuitable, and um, the quality of life is pretty appalling, I imagine, for them, so it's a relief to, to move one out, but, you know, there are many more, the pity you can't help them all, really. But there's a problem which could stop Rambo's move. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The team discovers that Rambo's transportation box has not been made to meet strict guidelines. <laughs> Unless changes are made, Rambo isn't going anywhere. It's supposed to have guillotine doors at both ends, not hinges, at both ends. That's the, that's the regulations. I'm sorry. It's not just about you know, making sure that all the air transport regulations are fulfilled and CITES regulations, but obviously it's got to be um, for us practically manageable when we get back to the zoo, which is why we also attach certain directives that said it needs to be you know, built in a certain way so that we can actually get the cap safely to where it needs to be when we get back to our facility as well. Obviously, it gets clock sticking in terms of what we can actually do and modifying these, these areas that are not quite suitable for what we'd like to see. Them. I've got guidelines, it's my name that goes to court. So unless it's how we want it to be, this won't be going. Simple. In Florida, the team from the Isle of Wight Zoo is facing problems with Tiger Rambo's transport box. It hasn't been built safely enough for his 20-hour journey to England. I could do it, but it's going to be 2 o'clock in the morning before it's done. I tell you that right now. Because that side, I didn't even cut the wood out. The door is there. Yeah. You can cut it out with a jigsaw when you get there. The man who's been looking after Rambo does not want to be interviewed. And he's reluctant to make the changes because he thinks that the box does follow US guidelines. The problem is he isn't considering British regulations. This wouldn't get me from Chester back to the Isle of Wight without someone nicking us for it. And that might be why there's a problem over here with cats being kept by people in their back garden because the laws are so slack, whereas we don't have that because they're not. And that's the difference, I think. You know, you've got this sort of thing going on and, you know, that sort of behaviour I'm not really into, to be honest. I've come here to do, you know, to help out and do a favour. I'm not really into this. I don't need this sort of shit. I've just bloody flown here, you know, for a two-day trip to bring him back, not have a lecture on what I'm doing. Normally, Rambo would be darted just once with sedative to get him safely into his travel box. Then he'd be released at the end of the journey through the box's sliding door. But his temporary carer is suggesting that he should be darted a second time when he arrives at the Isle of Wight Zoo and then carried into his enclosure. But too much sedative is dangerous, and Greg and Charlotte aren't happy. You've got enough drug to knock his ass out four more times afterwards because this is high potency. I spent $860 on these drugs. No, we've got, we've got drugs. It's just mm. I, did, I wanted to avoid having to knock him out again it. after the journey. That's the easiest part. Right after he gets there, you knock his ass out. When he wakes up, he's in a new enclosure. I'm not listening to that. But that bit the site is, as as shows guillotine. As long as you keep on and don't do what we want, then it, will, it won't be moving from this spot. I would feel happier if we went ahead mm. and tried to achieve what we're gonna, we, we could achieve on the mm. different door mechanism, and then if, the, if there was a real issue with darting him and moving him <laughs> the other end. Mm. You know, we don't know what state he's going to be in when he gets back after his travelling. Mm. And it might be that the vet would, you know, say, He's not happy to do that. That shows okay. the solid on the outside. After the some persuasion, else, yeah. things begin to look a little bit more positive. Yeah. So the the latest bit. is yeah, what if? they're rushing down to the hardware store because that's um, just about to close. But the door where I wanted it originally 
when he started being a bit awkward about it, he's now going to make. So it can go right into the bedroom. So we've been all around the houses in the last hour, but we're now back to where we wanted it to be in the first place, and he can now do it. OK. Everyone's getting on at the moment. So. <laughs> It's now a race against time to get Rambo's box ready. Back at the Isle of Wight Zoo, Keeper Helen has got a special treat for one of the tigresses. A feeder log. The wood has been drilled with holes and then filled with meat. The fire hose wrapped around it will give the big cat a good workout as she grips onto it whilst attacking the log. Last week, ten-year-old Lola moved home across the park. She was living in a quieter area of the zoo because when she first arrived from a circus, she was a very nervous cat. This is her first time in her new outside enclosure. There's lots to explore, but it's the feeder log that catches Lola's eye. When the other cats do this exercise, they tend to attack the log from below and try to pull it down. But Lola begins working out a different approach. So eventually, the log will remain completely in her grasp. Some meat falls out on the way, but she claims the main prize all for herself. In the wild, when a tiger makes a kill, it drags its prey away somewhere quiet. They eat as much as they want, sometimes bury it, and then return later when they're hungry again. Lola wants to drag off her prize, but she can't work out that the log is tethered at the top of the platform. The tigress is getting an excellent workout. She's had constant tension on her muscles and used dynamic force to lift the log. Big cats expend energy in short, sharp bursts, and this is what keeps them in top physical condition. And all the while, Lola has just one thing on her mind, taking the log off to her patch. But all of this brute force is not helping Lola drag off that prize. Probably a primate would have trace the rope back, the thing that's preventing it, and maybe try to attack the rope or maybe trying to get the knot undone or something, but the tiger just didn't think in, 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 that, in that sort of way. So that's, that's very clear. It's a, it's a very good demonstration of how the tiger's brain works. They're mainly mobile battering rams that, that do everything with brute force. They are highly dexterous and very delicate when they need to be, but quite often the way they solve problems can be very different from uh, other species and even individual between the individual cats. Effects. Lola has worked hard at this enrichment exercise, so it's only fair to help her out. The keepers put her back in her night den so they can go in and untie the log. And as expected, the tigress soon makes off with what's rightfully hers. back in Florida, and six hours of modifications have finally made Rambo's travelling box suitable for the journey back to England. Whilst he's still in his enclosure, he needs to be darted with sedative so he can be moved safely out into the box. But now it's dark, this is not going to be easy. Maybe if we all move away from this corner, he might come to this corner and then... 
Come on, Rambo. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Come on. Hold the light on the cat. I can't see it. Rambo. Good boy. The first shot missed. So a second dart is quickly prepared before Rambo becomes too agitated. Rambo Lito, I'm coming again. It's all yours. Come on, baby. Rambo is given an injection to reverse the sedative, but he may be sleepy for some time, and this should keep him calm as he's loaded into the transport van. It's in the early hours of the morning, about half past three in the morning, six hour drive ahead, but um, he's, uh, he's you know, set off, so um, we're just about to head off too. The um, whole process has taken a ridiculous amount of time. You know, we've, we've, we've got it done, but um, you know, really it could have been a lot smoother. Rambo finally begins his 20 hour journey to England. The Isle of Wight Zoo is home to 17 tigers, but that's soon to become 18. Over the last few days, animal manager Charlotte and general manager Greg have been in Florida rescuing 11-year-old male tiger Rambo. Can you say hello? Rambo? Hey, we've come a long way to see you. 20 hours after leaving his home in the USA, Rambo has arrived in England. He's on the last leg of his journey. We are at the moment crossing the Solent and um, en route back to the zoo with Rambo on the boat just below us here. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been eventful, that's an understatement. And we're, we're pretty glad, actually, that it's almost over. Uh, he's doing pretty well. He's um, obviously, you know, Bit upset with some of the journey and uh, taken it out on some of his box because that's you know what they do, but um, you know not a problem and uh, he'll soon be settling in uh, back uh, back home. Just yesterday, the team didn't think that Rambo could make the journey. His travelling crate hadn't been made to UK specifications. That problem was easily fixed, but there's no quick solution to the plight of big cats in captivity in the US. The good news is that we've taken one big cat out of several, well, tens of thousands of big cats that are left in, you know, dreadful situations in America. And most of that is due to the fact that the legislation in the States does not disallow people from keeping these sorts of animals in, in you know, over 50% of the states there. So, you know, you've got an epidemic of a problem, basically, and we got a taste for that. One of the sanctuaries that we went to whilst we were there you know, we're doing a really fantastic job, but as they said to us, they may t turn, turn away 300 animals a year that they can't cater for. So you see the scale of the problem. We'd love to be able to do more. We'd love to be able to, to take more of these animals that are desperately in need of a good home, ex-pets, ex-circus and so forth. But then obviously our responsibility is always lie with the animals that we've already brought into our care. So we just have to see how things go and when there is an opening, then obviously we'll pursue it and there's going to be no shortage of animals, um, you know, hoping, I guess, that they would come and, and be able to live with us. In less than an hour's time, Rambo will arrive at the zoo and his rehabilitation can begin. In many ways, tigers behave much like their domestic relatives. But in others, they're very different.
Tigers love to swim. Uh, they, they have this uh, phenomenal thing about water. They're drawn to it. I mean, water is very, very important to their survival, uh, even though that they get a lot, lot of moisture from the meat they eat. But if it's really warm, uh, sort of you're facing sort of really hot temperatures of 36 uh, to up to 40, uh, tigers like to submerge themselves in water and get really, uh, really cooled down. Tigers are very hardy animals. In the wild, their habitats range from the steamy jungles of India to the freezing wastes of Siberia. So a bit of English rain doesn't put them off either. They love it. I, you know, it's quite amazing because you know we get, uh, we, we we come to work, we wrap ourselves up in uh, in, in the best waterproofing material possible, and you let the, the cats out, and you can have uh, torrential downpour, and they're out there either lying in or playing in it. But the cats don't have to wait for a downpour to enjoy a good soaking. On hot days, the keepers simply take a hose to their enclosure. Big cats are lazy, and in the heat, they are even less active, so the water is a good way to encourage movement. White tigress Xena is particularly fond of water and immediately spots the spray. Xena only has one eye, and the sight in it isn't very good, so this is a perfect way for her to use her other senses. She can feel where the water is. And as usual with Xena, everything is tested by taste. Her sister Zia, on the other hand, isn't interested. She thinks of herself as a more upmarket cat, well above everyone else. Zena, however, is more than happy to muck around and get wet, but her play is quite gentle. Next door, Diamond's water hijinks reaches new heights. Tigers don't think like humans, and although we know he can't catch the spray, Diamond is sure that he can. In the heat, the cats need to stay cool. They do this by panting, but the cold water is a much easier way to cool off. Diamond loves to fall around, and trying to catch the jet stream will keep him happy for ages. At last, Rambo and the team have arrived at the zoo. Ah, home sweet home. Yeah, great to be back. Hopefully now everything goes smooth and within you know, half an hour he'll be cozying down on a nice straw bed somewhere. Hang on, it's OK. OK. Who's the that? first person keen to meet Rambo is the big cat supervisor, Paul. He looks really cool. He's, he looks much smaller than the photographs, because in the photographs he looks like, like Shandrew size. Oh, and Yankee looking nice, like really small. Rambo's journey took 20 hours, and apart from making a small peephole for himself, he seems to be taking it all in his stride. He's coped really well. I mean, he's not had any sedatives, and that's quite normal if you're flying animals, and obviously they're at altitude, and the last thing you want to do is be giving them sedative because it means they can't regulate their body temperature properly. So he's um, just by his own strength of character, I think, he's just actually been, been fine. We've been checking on him regularly and making sure that he's OK. And at the moment, he just seems to be quite curious, actually, more than anything. He's relatively calm, so it makes our life easier. And obviously for, for Paul and for the team when they're rehabilitating him here, if he's, if he's not come here highly stressed, then obviously that makes their life a lot easier as well. So, you know, it's looking really positive at the moment. Fifteen staff have been called in to help move Rambo's box out of the van, and it's not going to be easy. Because of the sheer size and it's really awkward trying to get it out with machinery, we're having to put it out by hand to, um, to be able to get hold of it, really. It's as simple as that. It's not, not a very easy job when it, the whole thing weighs 1,300 pounds. So, so I'll leave them to that bit. I've had enough uh, excitement for the last few days. The crate now needs to be moved very carefully. Balance is the key, as Rambo could be moving about inside, and if it topples over, the consequences could be devastating. Hello. There you go. Hello. 
The door of the box will be lined up exactly with the entrance to Rambo's bedroom, allowing him easy access. But someone has to stay with the box and lift up the door. I've got the short straw of actually letting him through opening up the door, so hopefully he won't keep us in there too long and, and go straight through, then we can all go home and get some sleep. In Florida, Rambo didn't have a bedroom, as the warm temperatures meant he could sleep outside. He's not used to going inside, so he's cautious about leaving his box. Because he's not, Rambo's not being used to having a bedroom facility like this, um, so obviously it's a, a, a dark area for him. We can't really see anything at the end and, and, and to the side, so he's a bit wary about that. He'll be fine. The guys are just going to get some meat at the moment, so we can put some incentives in there for him but this often happens actually and when you open a door to a, a crate where an animal's been for a little while you'd expect maybe an animal's going to bolt out often it isn't the case because that's their security zone so he would have formed a little comfort zone in there over the last few hours that he's been in there and now he's obviously not too happy about coming out so we've got to wait a little while to get our sleep and um just let everything happen in his own time that's that's always the key if you don't do that if you not patient enough, then you risk obviously upsetting the animal and blowing your chances of having a good relationship with that animal. Um, so it's of paramount importance, especially obviously Paul and the captain that are going to be working closely with Rambo. He's got to associate them with something at least neutral to begin with and certainly not anything negative. So yeah, we'll, we'll be basically just, you know, waiting for him to tell us when he wants things to happen. So I think you'll have to have it up and yeah. hold it up. Yeah, I'm just going to hold it up. Eventually, Rambo comes out. The first steps into his new life. Looking after big cats isn't easy. They're lazy and love to rest. But to ensure they're healthy, they must be kept active. Cats are motivated by food, so at the Isle of Wight Zoo, the keepers create what they call enrichment to encourage movement. The 22 big cats living here consume a massive 30 tonnes of meat every year. And horse is a particular favourite. But living at the far end of the zoo are three medium-sized cats called servals. They enjoy smaller prey. They're highly specialised rodent hunters. We've got to spend some time with the little guys as well, uh, which is pretty vital, making sure that uh, they, they, get to, uh, they get a little bit of exercise, a little bit of fun as well. Um, so on a smaller scale, we're doing a bit of pole PT is what we do with, uh, with the big cats. Uh, and uh, that works uh, pretty well with these guys. In the wild, servals are active cats. So Keeper Paul is tempting them with rabbit meat attached to a pole. It's one of their favourite foods, and the pole should make them work hard for their prize. You're not putting the effort into it, are you? What is that? That is terrible. You've got to fight for it. That was useless, do you know that? Eh? Out of all the things you've done. Shingy. Shingy. Mm. Come over here. You know you want again. Well, it may have been a very half-hearted attempt, but Shingi got her prize, and she's enjoying tucking in. But as big cats are so lazy, it's important they don't overeat, so the keepers have to come up with enrichment that doesn't always involve food. This is a hessian sack for Jaguar Chiquita. It's filled with hay that's been soaked in men's aftershave. I know this might sound strange, but as well as food, cats are also motivated by scent. Scents are very important to um, cats, and uh, what they tend to do is when they go around marking their territory, uh, they pick up on other scents as well. Uh, they're picking up other signs from cats, from their faeces and their urine. Um, this is very important. It tells them important messages, who's actually passed that way. Then they, they know if there's somebody in their territory. Chiquita immediately sees the sack 
and is instantly drawn to its unusual scent. She clearly likes the feel of the Hessian sack. It's a material she can really dig her claws into. Jaguars have an extra sense to us. It's a sort of cross between taste and smell, which they activate by opening their mouths and inhaling. It's known as the Fleming response. Chiquita is clearly taken with this smelly sack. That was a really good result. Really pleased with that. Um, 20 minutes is a very good result for working with a jaguar. Normally, we're not quite sure. Uh, if you give them meat feeds and things, they uh, don't spend very much time with the boxes that, the, that contain the meat. So we're very pleased because there was no meat used today. It was just the hay and the straw. So, yeah, very good result. Now Chiquita's used a burst of energy, it's time to catch up with some much-needed rest. After napping during the day, the cats have plenty of energy conserved to get to grips with their evening feed. At the zoo, this usually takes place in their night dens, but tonight, it's happening outside. Well, tonight we're actually in uh, the Zina and Zia's enclosure. Um, we are uh, going to do a bit of enrichment. Um, the reason is because, well, why should enrichment just take place during the day? Uh, cats are, are notoriously uh, crepuscular, which means that they do most of their hunting at night and that, so this is a really good chance for them to see just exactly how, how they move about. Um, and it's going to be quite a, quite a sort of uh, interesting experiment for us as well, as well as the cats. It's something else, it's something new that they're doing. And if, if, we, can, if we can continuously do something that, that's, that's, that's new for the, for, for the tigers, we, we're going we're gonna, to um, create a much happier cat at the end of the day, and that's, that's our ultimate aim. Zia and Zina immediately smell the meat in their enclosure. Tiger's eyes are designed to maximise the absorption of natural light. This makes their sight seven times better than ours. Night enrichment opens up a whole new world for the cats and Zia's natural hunting instincts definitely kick in. Next morning, there's some terrible news about one of the female tigers. Well, real shocker. Last night, Paul was putting the cats to bed, the, the routine in the evening of letting the cats into the night dens, and um, Natasha failed to come in. So when he took a closer look, he found her lying down on the side by one of the huts in the outdoor enclosure. She seemed to just be resting, was in a quite natural position to be resting, but very soon realised that there was just no response at all and, and basically had found her dead. Natasha's death has come as a complete shock to everyone. Charlotte and the team need to know how and why she died, so vet Ian Green is here to perform a post-mortem. We found that there didn't seem to be any signs of struggle in the enclosure, like, and, you know, sort of, she'd been, you know, dug, digging the ground. It just right, like so just laid down peacefully yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and gone. Nice. OK. And previous day, she'd been perfectly normal? Yeah, she's, yeah. she's eaten every day. Right. Well. She's eaten her food every day yeah. without any problems, so she's taken that day quite well. Right. She's in good body condition here. Um, her gums look a little bit pale and her tongue looks a little bit blue. That could be for a variety of different reasons. One possible reason with her dying fairly suddenly could be if, she was bleed if she'd bled out internally. Um, but uh, we'll find out in a moment. Firstly, Ian will look at Natasha's internal organs. If there's nothing conclusive there, he'll have to look at the brain. At almost 16, Natasha was an elderly cat, and she had arthritis. 
It's very common in older cats, but she also had problems with slipped discs in her back, which may have caused her premature arthritis. Natasha's mobility was improving, though. We've been managing her very carefully. She's been responding really well to our treatment plan. And she has been, to all intents and purposes, a different cat this year. You know, we've all been over the moon with her improvement. The team are sure that Natasha's back problems wouldn't have caused her death, so Ian continues his investigation. He finds nothing in Natasha's abdomen, so he moves up to her chest area, and he wants to eliminate one possibility. Just check that she doesn't actually choke on anything. As soon as you open that, Ian, all the lungs deflated. Yeah. Would that indicate there'd be a blockage? Yeah. Ah, yeah. She choked. Jesus. Christ. Oh, she God. choked. All that down the airway. Oh. Basically found a large, large lump of meat that was halfway down her trachea and halfway down her esophagus. It had wrapped around in a kind of U-shaped bend. That really is bizarre. But, yeah, I'm afraid she choked to death. Of all possible causes of death, this was the last thing the team expected. Yeah, what can you say? We didn't know what we were going to find, simple as that. You know, she had been perfectly healthy, apart from her ongoing back troubles, but tragically they had been improving. And then it comes down to something as freak as a piece of meat. You know, obviously we're careful with the kind of meat that we feed them and the sizes of meat that we feed them. We wouldn't feed them a narrow, thin strip of meat. You know, that was a good size, normal piece of meat that we've been feeding for years. You know, we've, we've fed thousands of times. Um, and there was some reason why it didn't go down as it should have done. So it's, it's a difficult one, you know, to, to deal with and um, get, get your mind around, really. It just takes time. It would be, you know, a little time for us to get used to the zoo without Natasha in it. The Isle of Wight Zoo is home to 17 tigers of three different subspecies. Tiger numbers in the wild are dangerously low, and the zoo plays an important part in the preservation of the species. And when their tigers die, the big cats continue to play an important role. Today, the animal manager, Charlotte, has travelled to the National Museum Scotland in Edinburgh. Twenty years ago, Dr Andrew Kitchener set up a unique network of British and European zoos for animal research. So that when an animal dies of natural causes within the zoo, rather than just incinerating it and losing any value that that might have for research and for the benefit of those species, I've tried to persuade them to send their dead animals here. And our aim, therefore, is to preserve them so that we create a research resource not only for our research that we do ourselves, but also for the wider research community, and that's been very, very successful. These are two Siberian tigers that we gave over to Andrew a few years ago now. So they've travelled quite a long distance to come up to him, and it's slightly odd, I have to say, seeing them in two dimensions rather than three, but still incredibly recognisable, you know, straight off by coloration, patination. Um, so that they still feel like cats that I know and, and love very much. So it's extremely important for me and, and the rest of the staff as well at the zoo to know that when the cats are dead, they actually do hold a value that's of significance. And all too often these days, tigers, when they're dead, you know, hold an illegal value, if you like, for the um, black market and trade in tiger bones, etc. So to know that they're coming here and actually they're going to help with future, we hope, you know, future preservation of the species and furthering our understanding of the species is fantastic for us. The animal's skins play a big part in Andrew's research into tigers. What we can do here is compare individuals mm -hmm. and see the variation within a particular population or subspecies or whatever. And if we slide these skins past each other, you can actually see this variation quite distinctly. One of the skins, is much darker, it's much more boldly marked, and the other one is much paler, and, and the stripes are much less well-defined. And 
you know, that's just individual variation. Mm. This must present quite a challenge for you, though, because you know, we tend to think about things, I think, too black and white when it comes to classifying animals and um, maybe oversimplify some issues. That's right, and the only way that you can get a handle on this is to have a large number of tigers to look at to see what the total variation is within that particular species. The museum also works with animal skeletons, DNA samples and muscle tissue. This research helps zoos develop their animal husbandry and it also helps protect animals all over the world. We can also contribute to the banning of the trade in tiger parts because we've been developing atlases of tiger bones that enforcement agencies can use to identify those bones that are being illegally traded. Back at the Isle of Wight Zoo, it's playtime for the lions. The keepers are setting up a feeder log, which should stimulate the lion's natural hunting and attacking behaviour. For the past few weeks, the zoo has been trying out feeder logs on the other big cat species. The wood is filled with meat and wrapped in fire hose to give the cats something to grip. The tigers and jaguars live alone, so they keep the prize all to themselves. But today, lion twins Snoopy and Charlie Brown are both going to have a go. Now, the boys can fight, particularly at mealtimes. So the dominant brother, Snoopy, will have a go first. Usually, the lions eat their meat on the ground, but today, they have a challenge. Because lions don't initially climb trees because they're far too heavy anyway and uh, quite clumsy. So we're going to set it hopefully at a height that he's going to see it as soon as he comes out and uh, go in for the attack. Uh, so uh, it would be quite interesting to see what he actually does. He might sort of attempt to go up the tree but uh, I think he'll um, try and nail it as it's just hanging down. Because he's dominant, Snoopy should be more aggressive and inquisitive. but the nine-year-old seems very unsure about the swinging log. The more he grabs at it, the more it swings. Usually when a lion attacks its prey, it holds on to it until its victim stops moving. But Snoopy just can't work out that unless he hangs on, he won't get his reward. To stimulate him a bit more, his brother Charlie Brown is let in to see what he makes of the new toy. And there seems to be some role reversal. Charlie Brown sends Snoopy packing. Snoopy is usually the more dominant, but because he backed down even for just a second, Charlie Brown took his opportunity to show he can be boss. Charlie's veins are very pumped up, which shows he's enjoying attacking the log and using all of his muscles. In the wilds, I mean, they, they work as a team, so it's a, a complete team effort. But on occasions, if any of them show the weakness, then the other one will, will try and come in and take over, and this is what it's all about in the wild. So it's quite interesting to see it in, you know, in, in human care. They're, they're actually, you know, showing sort of aggression, really. Snoopy's decided enough is enough. He's the boss, and now his brother has shown him what to do with the log. He wants it back. He grabs his prey and holds it steady. And even though all of the meat has gone, Snoopy makes sure this prize is definitely his. While Charlie Brown is a mere spectator. National Museum Scotland is home to 100,000 species of dead mammals and birds for research. Everything is analysed, from the skin to the bones. 
I mean, the advantage of sending animals here is that we do get a chance to look at their skeletons in some detail and find out what's wrong with them. And the problem when the animal is alive is you can't get close to it, you can't x-ray the important bits necessarily. So by collecting lots of information from lots of different captive animals, we can build up a probability that at a certain age it'll be suffering this condition or, or it'll be suffering that condition at that age. And that allows the zoo world to take a much more informed decision about what, how they're going to treat these animals. The Isle of Wight Zoo has sent five of its big cats to Andrew for research, and one in particular has shown significant findings. OK, Charlotte, here we have the vertebral column or spine of Shere Khan, the Indian tiger, who you sent to us uh, five years ago now from the Isle of Wight Zoo. As you know, he was very old, he was about 24 years he old. Was, he was, an old much, boy. Much older than any other big cat that we have in the collection. And it's quite interesting that he has these sort of arthritic-like problems along his uh, vertebral column. And if you can see here, you see these sort of funny bony growths developing around the oh, articulations yeah. mm -hmm. here and also underneath. And in fact, in this case, uh, the two vertebrae are actually fused together. Wow. And this happens when these bony growths just grow into each other right. and the whole vertebrae fuse together. And it's very unusual to find this in a cat. In fact, it's the only cat we have that shows this. It's very common in bears. It's quite yeah. common in human beings, even. But uh, it's very unusual you to find it in a cat. You haven't seen it in big cats before? No, no. But we don't find all big cats like that. But we got two tigers that were 13 and 14-year-old old tigers, and they fed every day by climbing a telegraph pole to get their meat. Yeah. And they were super fit tigers. There wasn't an ounce of fat on them, and they would just leap and bound around. It was a tremendous sight. And unfortunately, these animals died. But when we looked at their skeletons, they were perfect. There wasn't anything wrong. So I suspect activity levels may have something to do with this. The Isle of Wight Zoo does use feeding poles and devices where the cats have to reach and move for their food. The museum's research proves that this has a positive effect on the health and the long-term mobility of big cats. Some cats, though, develop arthritis, even though they're well looked after. At the zoo, 15-year-old Zar is on medication for this condition. But after seeing the severity of Shere Khan's arthritis, Charlotte knows they may not be doing enough. They need to take more x-rays to monitor Zar's bone condition. At the end of the day, it's difficult in terms of the management of an animal that's got arthritis. It's very, very hard. You know, what the x-ray tells you is so much. What you can't do is speak to the animal and say, you know, how's your back pain today? <laughs> you know, you, you, you just don't know. Um, the animal's no way of telling you. The team will continue to closely monitor Zar's behaviour and mobility. It's been a challenging year for the Isle of Wight Zoo's only white tiger, Xena. The sanctuary has worked hard to keep her happy and stimulated in her enclosure since an operation to remove her eye. Some of these enrichment techniques worked, and others didn't. But it's hoped today the keepers have found something that will really test her remaining senses. One of our keepers, Helen, has actually come up with a great idea. She's got a, she's got a, a conventional uh, common or garden beer barrel, and we, we strapped a couple of tyres to it, and it's going to be able to float. Zena's going to be able to pull out the water, she'll tug it around all over the place, and it's just a toy for her. We're going to give it a try and see how we go. And there's an added extra. Because Zena has very poor eyesight, the barrel is filled with stones, which should make this a perfect audio game. Zena is a big fan of her pond, so she always makes a beeline for it. And even though she can't quite see the barrel yet, she can certainly smell that something new has landed on her patch. Zeno is drawn to the different textures of the rubber and the metal. And it doesn't seem to taste too bad either. But what she reacts to most of all is the sound of the small stones rattling on the inside of the metal barrel.
tigers have a short attention span, but Xena has no intention of letting this go. So, this audio enrichment is proving to be the perfect workout. Maybe the slight smell of beer helped, um, but uh, she seemed to, seemed to like it and she seemed to do lots of things with it and there was no food involved, so that's quite interesting. It will soon be time for Zena's sister, Zia, to be let out into the enclosure too. So Zena cleverly decides to drag off her toy and hide it away in the bushes. It's been commonly thought that there are nine subspecies of tiger worldwide. But over the past 10 years, Andrew Kitchener's research has shown that it's not as clear-cut as that. Instead, there may be gradual variations over different geographical areas. This is the skin of a Sumatran tiger, female Sumatran tiger. And I think you'll notice that the skin looks quite dark, doesn't it? Yeah. A lot more stripes, a lot more spots as well in amongst those stripes. And also the fur is very, very short. Yeah. If we, we've got here the skin of an Amur tiger, which is the other end of the extreme. And the difference there is incredible. It's isn't incredibly it? different. The, the fur is much longer. This whiter. is also a female, yeah, it's whiter. Uh, the overall coloration is much paler. And there's far fewer stripes. And of course, in the past, people have said that these represent different species, let alone different subspecies. So what we've done is we've tried to look at this variation in the striping pattern and in the coloration and so on. And what we've found, actually, is that there's a very gradual change from the north of the range down to the south. So you get these large, pale tigers with few stripes. And as you go further south, down into the Malay Peninsula, into Sumatra and Java, so you get more stripes and a darker coloration. But there's no distinct difference. There's no obvious difference. And so instead of the eight or nine subspecies that people think there are, we think there may be two or three. I mean, that's mm. all. So you've basically got a mainland tiger and an island tiger. Yeah. And we've got the two extremes here. This research means that diminishing wild populations could be reinforced by neighbouring groups, which were previously considered to be other subspecies. Tigers can travel a thousand kilometres. They can swim across rivers 29 kilometres wide. They can swim across the sea for 14 kilometres. So they're very highly mobile animals. So you're not telling me that these could be very distinct. They must be moving around all the time and mixing their genes. When I gave this paper, I thought, well, they're all going to jump on me and say, what a load of old rubbish. But in fact, everybody came up and told me they knew that already, and they just didn't know how to explain it. So that was very nice. And, uh, and there are many people working in India and Russia and so on who have expressed their support for that and, and their belief that that probably is what's going on. But we mustn't forget there are other genetic studies going on which seem to show something different. So the, the matter is far from settled and we need to do more research together to try and resolve the issue because if we don't, then we can't effectively conserve wild tiger populations. Sadly, it's too late for one particular subspecies of tiger. In this box, I have a very sad footnote to tiger history because in it we have the skull of a Javan tiger. Wow. And as you know, there are no tigers on Java time, anymore. Yeah. Um, it's extinct and became extinct probably about 30 or 40 years ago. So unfortunately, the only remnants we have of this uh, once proud animal are skins and skulls and other bones in museums. And it would be incredibly sad if that's all, all tigers ended up this way. India is home to half the world's remaining wild tiger population. Their numbers have dramatically declined because of poaching and habitat loss. In 2002, it was estimated there were over 3,500 tigers left in India, but a new census this last year has revealed much more concerning news. There are now only half that number. Three days ago, the zoo welcomed a new addition, 11-year-old male tiger, Rambo. When he arrived here, we were quite surprised when we were offloading him, just how calm he was, because he'd had a 36-hour journey. Um, and although we tried to, to make sure it went as smoothly as possible, 
obviously you've got lots of different modes of transport. I mean, he was by road, by plane, by road, by ferry, by road. And, um, and then all the offloading process, he actually has coped remarkably well. We've all been really, really bowled over actually by how well he's taken it. But today's the day that we've kind of been waiting for. We can actually step out into what's going to be his home for six months into the outside of the quarantine zone and get to know his space a bit. This is Rambo's quarantine enclosure, but it's still a much bigger space than he had in Florida, so it might take him a while to brave it outside. But true to his confident form, the new boy starts to explore in a matter of seconds, and once he starts, he can't stop sniffing. <coughs> He's also getting unusually inquisitive. He's been showing some strange behaviours, and one of those is actually grazing. Um, sort of a tiger version of a lawnmower at the moment. Really enjoying the grass, I think. Grazing is an unusual behaviour for a tiger, but the grass here is very different in texture and taste to what he's been used to, and it seems he doesn't want to miss a thing. The platform, vertical scratch pole and the den are all things that Rambo hasn't experienced before and they've kick-started some of his natural tiger behaviours. He now has some things he can actually scent mark. Rambo has symmetrical bare patches of skin from where he had to lie on a concrete floor. But the thick grass outside and the wood wool in his night den will soon make this better. At 11, Rambo is an older tiger, but he's well toned. Now he has more physical things to do and plenty of stimulation, his mobility and muscle tone should get even better. But for now, Charlotte and the team couldn't be happier with Rambo's progress. Absolutely amazing. Anyone that bet that he'd be coming out after five seconds would have been right. It literally looked like he was at the end of his quarantine period rather than stepping out to start it. So, yeah, we've been blown away. This cat is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, we're just really enjoying watching him enjoying himself at the moment and just being you know, really settled in his environment already. It's, it's great. I don't know how long he's got left to live, you know, maybe ten years. But let's hope that he's going to live those 10 years, you know, with a life that's uh, of good quality for him. So, yeah, we feel that, you know, we really have fulfilled our role in that respect. There are now more tigers reported in captivity in Florida and Texas than there are left in the wild. Rambo was one of thousands of big cats in the US in need of rescue. Some states have strict laws, others none at all, and most people can't look after them properly. In our opinion, the situation isn't good enough, even if the desire to help from the people is, is relatively genuine. If they don't have the ability to do that because of their resources, their knowledge and so forth, then the animals shouldn't be suffering because of that. So in that case, laws have got to change. America knows this, but in terms of actually changing anything, you know, in the foreseeable future, I don't see that happening. So there's going to be, you know, several more cases like Rambo's, I think, that are going to be coming our way. Mm -hmm.